Welcome back viewers. I am Frederick Norona. This is Literary Goa, the program on books and authors who write on Goa. Today we have with us a friend who is passing through Goa and we are taking advantage of the presence of Paul Melo Castro in our studio. So Paul is a, is, is a professor at the University of Glasgow in Scotland and uh, he's been doing this fascinating job of translating Goan short stories written in Portuguese into English. Uh, not only is it fascinating because it helps us remember what we have forgotten, but he also uh, has to dig up these stories from various sources all over the place. So Paul, tell us uh, how you got started, when you got started. We were just talking about it before the recording. Well, great. Thank you very much, um, Frederick. Thank you for the, for the opportunity to be here and to speak to you and to speak to your viewers. Um, so where I got started, maybe, um, yeah, maybe the, the clue is in my name, as you, as you put it. My name is Paul Melwi Kashlu, which I suppose here in Goa in some ways wouldn't be an unusual name, but, but in Portugal and England is slightly more unusual. So we've talked before about, um, you know, the Paul was chosen by my, by my mother, who is English, uh, and the Melwi Kashlu comes from my father, who is Portuguese. Um, so I guess there's that family background, which meant that quite naturally I was moving between two languages um, and had a, an aptitude and interest in translation in a very general sense. Um, so later on, uh, I studied for a PhD in Portuguese literature and culture. Um, and after I finished that, I was looking around for a project to do. And one of the, if you like, one of the salient developments in um, literary studies in Portuguese over, say, the past 20 years, or more, more than that, since, um, since the beginning of the 80s, has been an expansion beyond um, Portuguese literature, beyond Brazilian literature, to literatures that were written in former Portuguese colonies. Um, now, that was mainly, or, or at least the, the focus has been Africa, partly because the countries in Africa that were Portuguese colonies have maintained Portuguese as an official language. But when I was looking around for this new project, it struck me that there was nothing written or there didn't seem to be very much um, about other places. Uh, and the place that particularly interested me was Goa, um, because my own family background is connected to Goa. So my father was born here and his family were um, settled in Goa for, for, for a long time before leaving, um, just before 1961. Uh, and that brought me to thinking, well, you know, is there, was there anything written in Portuguese from Goa? Um, I, at that time, I, I hadn't heard of anything. I didn't know of anything. I started to, um, I started to look around and uh, do some research. Um, to, so you virtually found a lot of it yourself? I, I did. So the first stop was um, this book called A Literatura Indo-Portuguesa, so Indo-Portuguese Literature, um, a two-volume study by um, Vimala Devi, um, it's the pen name of a writer called um, Teresa de Petit uh, Almeida um, and her husband, Ben Manuel de Siabre. Uh, and that really alerted to me lots of things. It brought me to her short stories, which I, I read and loved. Uh, and then my... This was published in the 60s, 70s? So the short stories, which I found, Monsoon, uh, Monsoon which we might talk a little bit about later, was published in 1963. Uh, the volume of essays was published in 1971, um, so that kind of that first decade after the end of after the end of Portuguese rule, uh, and really the um, the interest and the research snowballed from there. I, I, you know, I found more and more things, and I I, I, uh, and I think it was true to say that at the time that I was looking at it, there wasn't much interest either um, here in India or in, indeed uh, in Portugal. But I think since then. Um, you know, in, in, in the way that happens so often, um, there's something in the air which means that several different people have a very similar idea. Um, and, you know, people, I, I began to meet people in Portugal who were starting to look at this, this Goan literature and this, this, this period in Goa. Uh, and I started to meet people in Brazil who were also doing something similar. Uh, and I think that general interest gradually coalesced into the project called Pensando Goa, uh, Thinking Goa which is based at the University of Sao Paulo and which um, which has, I think, in the past couple of years been very successful at bringing a diverse uh, group of people interested in Go in the broadest sense um, together across uh, across time zones, <laughs> which, some, which sometimes presents its own uh, its own kind of logistical difficulties, but which um, I think which has been very, very, very stimulating, very successful and I think ultimately very, very good for Goa. 
So, uh, of course, you kept your blog and other things which also made your own work visible and convinced many others that there is something going on here. I'm not saying you're the only one who did it, but sure. uh, in the world of the short story, you revived and made us aware of a whole lot of things which we thought didn't exist, right? Yeah, the, I mean, I think the blog was, was interesting. So um, the first project I did um, as part of a, a short fellowship, which exists in, in Britain for people immediately outside of their, of their PhDs. And it was that fellowship that brought me to, um, brought me to, not the first time to go where I'd been before, but the first time to go on a work trip. Uh, and at that time, the archives were still based in the old central library. Um, and I spent a, a kind of a monsoon month, which <laughs> I think shows my innocence at that time. I, you know, I sort of came during my summer holiday. It's a dark time. Yeah. And it was, it was I, I guess it, it had the, the advantage of concentrating my mind on what I was doing. There was, so I, I spent a month. You um, were how old then? Sorry? You were how old then? I, I would have been uh, 30, 31. So yeah, uh, younger, younger than I am now. Um, and I spent just the, the month going through old newspapers uh, and finding things. Um, so that blog really was a result of me finding much more than I set out to, to, to look for. So as I went through the years, I went through the different publications, I found things which I think, well, thought, wow, that's, that's interesting. So what Goan, should I do Goan with this? short stories in Portuguese were mostly emerging in the newspapers in those days? Uh, I think that's fair to say. Um, there, wasn't, um, there wasn't really uh, kind of a, a, I mean, uh, there wasn't really, so I, I know in, in a way this sort of, flies in the face of the, 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 the name that you've chosen for your own publishing concern. But although you know, there was a long-standing history of public, yeah, publishing in Goa. It was a colonial and, press and it was not used by locals. Yeah, so, and, so yeah. people didn't really publish much yeah. then. And one of the things that Devi and Siabra say in their work is that um, the history of writing in um, Portuguese and Goa suffered a little for so much of, of it being published in Lisbon rather than published locally. So really the outlet was um, either the radio that was popular um, and uh, I think it's interesting the way in which radio publication also has shaped the, the style and content of the stories, but also newspaper publication. So if you go back to look at the newspapers um, in over the Portuguese new newspapers over the 20th century, there's a what you might call a lack of specialization. So if you like, publication was in the newspapers. So we, we heard that fascinating talk you just had with uh, the previous speaker, Radharal Gracias, which he's sort of talked about how people um, kind of read more back then because now people have um, you know, the internet. If you like, the, the, the mobile phone of the 20th century was the newspaper and what you could find you found there. So it was news, it was adverts, but it was also short stories, it was translations, it was excerpts from foreign newspapers. So those Portuguese newspapers, O Heraldo, India Portuguesa, um, A Vida, and they've been various over the 20th century, they were much more miscellaneous than newspapers now. Um, I think you know, they, they would have, there would be points where it was mostly news, there'd be points where it was more essay, and there were times, especially around holidays like um, Christmas or Diwali, which, in which they quite often published longer um, issues, um, there would be short stories, there would be poetry. Um, yeah, which um, which makes them really really kind of fascinating to 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 read. Um, I think there was also a, an extent to which um, there weren't clear boundaries between different avenues of um, literary expression. So people moved from journal. I mean, in, in the way that they still are now, right? You talked about the the multifarious career of our previous speaker, but um, yeah, but the. Uh, the you know, back in those days, people also moved between. So people didn't just write short stories. You know, people didn't live as authors. They did various things. Uh, and um, the concerns and themes and indeed the kind of way they expressed themselves bled across their different, um, from, from their poetry to their short stories, but also to, um, to, to, to more straight journalistic um, work. That's very, that's very interesting. Tell us about uh, your works so far in terms of your books. You come across with a lot of collections, translations, uh, very readable ones, uh, yeah. I must say. Uh, people like Manohar Shetty has great appreciation for your work. He says that Paul Melo Castro has shown us stories which we didn't know existed. So how have you put this across? I know some of them because I'm involved with it in a way, wow. but uh, that, that, that's not the issue here. Uh, tell us about your own work. What, uh, where, where, where can people find your work? Online, print, books, what? Um, well, 
if I, if I could maybe start by, by demurring a little bit, when you say that your own involvement in publishing isn't relevant, I, I, I would disagree and say that it is highly relevant. Um, I, I talked at the beginning about how I'd always been drawn to translation because of my particular background. Um, and I, I think I'd always had the, the desire to do it. But where I really started um, to actually think, well, I should sit down, I should actually you know, get hold of these stories and bring them into English. Uh, I think it was um, a sort of a challenge that you issued. You said, look, you know, I think people here in Goa would be interested to read these. If you wanted to translate them, then you know, I would publish them. And I think even then, maybe Goa 1556 was in its infancy when the, when the idea was first floated. And it was actually having that um, concrete place to publish them that really inspired me to do it, right? Because otherwise, you know, translation's a difficult situation. I think um, we need many more of those because uh, yeah. Goa being such a multilingual society, as we were just saying before we started, Sure. Yeah, unfortunately, we don't uh, represent ourselves as multilingual. You think yeah. we are very monolingual, actually. But. I think that's yeah. I think that, that's. I think there is a there is a certain sort of moni plural moni plurilingualism. There are lots of languages, but they're they're kind of. You talked about silos before this yeah. kind of modern uh, metaphor, but they seem to have their own sort of discrete um, their own discrete. Uh, milieu and they don't necessarily cross across. So Lending Shadows was your first collection of short stories in two volumes? Yeah, that was my first. Two um, features there? Which, which well, kind of writers? So just to give a, a quick description, it covers a time span of a, between the mid 1860s to around 1987. Um, there have been kind of things published in Portuguese after that. I mean, even until the present day, every now and again, you still have yeah. things published in, in Portuguese. Um, it's worth mentioning here Ave Cleto Afonso's Vaticinio do Suarga, which, um, yeah, I mean, I think in another language, perhaps another place, it would really be a, a, quite, um, a quite significant intervention into literature. You know, this, this kind of Can you describe it? So it's a, it's a rewriting of um, the Lucidas, so Camões' great epic of Portuguese expansion, kind of rewritten in Portuguese, but from a, a kind of a Go and Indian point of view. And if we can think about how, um, you know, through post-colonial literatures, this kind of rewriting of the classic text has been such a powerful tool. I and mean, you can think of things like um, all, the, all the rewritings of uh, things like Robinson Crusoe, or the rewriting of um, Jane Eyre in the Wide Sargasso Sea. Um, you know, this kind of taking of a classic text and saying, look, this is, for, however classic this is, it's only telling the story from one point of view. There's this huge other point of view which has been occluded and that's a, that, that hiding of that point of view has, has a really powerful effect on the, the, the meaning of that text. So to, to actually take this kind of 16th century verse epic and then write a reply using the kind of the same verse form in Portuguese in Goa is, 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 is really a huge thing. But um, unfortunately, I think partly due to the, um, the kind of the modesty of the author, uh, and I think partly to do with the particular situation of Goa and perhaps a certain invisibility of Goa in Portugal and an invisibility of Portuguese in Goa, or relative invisibility, um, the work has slightly fallen through the cracks. And that's, that's a real shame. That's true with a lot yeah. of our books. You know, I feel it yeah. all the time in that sense. We yeah. don't do justice to, yeah. to our books yeah. anyway. Yeah. I mean, there is a... a so, sort of talking a little bit about the, the translations and the importance of the translations, there's a, a kind of a concept that I... I came across when I was doing a piece of work, um, yeah, a few a few months back, which is the idea of the great unread, um, and the fact that of all the books published, you know, ninety nine percent of them sort of vanish into a sort of limbo, and they might they might be on dusty shelves in libraries, they might be hidden in cupboards in uh, in bookstores, but they're not really being actively read. And when a book isn't being actively read, it doesn't exist. Scary thought, yeah, that's a scary it's thought. A bit, it's, 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 a very, it's, a, it's a very scary thought. And then you can think, well, what do we do to try to change that situation? Uh, and you said how perhaps um, the, the richness of multilingualism in Goa hasn't or isn't being as uh, taken advantage of as it could. Um, and it seems to me that the, the sort of... Um, the sort of fields that, in a way, I'm, I'm starting to work in, and in which you know, books like um, the ones we're talking about here could be 
could be thought of things like translation studies. So how do we think about the relationships between different languages? You know, what happens when we move books between different languages? What happens when people speak different languages and make options when they're writing in one language, but perhaps bringing in aspects of other languages? Um, you know, and this idea of um, world literature, which is something very, um, you know, very, very kind of cutting edge at the moment. Um, my professional position in Glasgow is as a, a teacher of comparative literature. So the thing that I have to discuss with my students and think with my students is, you know, how do we compare different books? How do we compare books which are written in different places, different times, and different languages? Yeah. Uh, and it seems to me that um, you know, Goa is, in a way, should be such, uh, um, such a, a key case study because that idea of having different times, different languages, and different places is sort of collapsed into this tiny place. I mean, there have been so many languages, there have been so many connections with different places. There have been people who have moved between different, different historical periods with very different ideas and ideologies and kind of leading um, concepts. And somehow, um, you know, Goa's continued and people have managed to negotiate all of those changes and all of those languages. Yet I'm not sure that we're, we're, we're kind of thinking about that, that process of negotiation. I don't know if it's because there, 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 are, there are perceptions of, of kind of rivalries and this idea that if we, if we kind of open things up, then maybe we end up taking space away from something else. Mm -hmm. And certainly I think there are, that, 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 that could be a risk. So Lengthening Shadows is your first set of two, long, two collections where sure. you uh, look at short stories written over a 130 year period almost. Yeah. After that comes... Yeah. So after that, I did a translation of Vimala Devi's um, book, Monsel. Wait, this is published in Calcutta? This is published by um, Seagull? by Seagull Press, um, but best, uh, sort of based in, based in Calcutta. Um, so it's and available online. And available, and, and, and it's it, called? It's called? So in English, it's just called Monsoon. Monsoon. So I, I, st I stuck with a, fairly, um, with a fairly kind of close translation. So it's a set of, uh, I think, about 15 short stories. It was, so it was first published in 1963, and then the author published an, an augmented volume in 2003, I think, which added three stories. And those extra three stories make all the difference Thank because it brings, the, it brings the collection in a, to kind of come full circle. So it sort of ends with somebody leaving Goa. It sort of begins with somebody leaving Goa, then ends with somebody returning to Goa. And then you have uh, life stories. Uh, and then I have life stories. So um, this book by, well... So it's not, it's not the translation of a book by Maria Elsa Rocha. So in, in a way, this is an example of, I think, how you know, translation can bring in something new. She wrote in the newspaper Avida, which was a, a, a Margaon-based newspaper that existed, I think, until the mid-60s, yeah. in which there was, an, there was an attempt to, swat, to, sw uh, to, to switch to Konkani as a medium, but I think that failed. It merged with another newspaper and eventually disappeared. But for those first um, almost a decade of, um, you know, after 1961, she ran a, a kind of a literary um, space within the newspaper mm -hmm. and she published um, a, a collection of about, um, about a dozen short stories. So Maria Elsa de Rocha is also happens to be the sister of Leopold Rocha, who's a writer. And so she's the sister of Leopold de, de Rocha, who has published several books in Portugal, in Portuguese. Um, yeah, I, I, again, it's one of, maybe that's something we can sort of talk a little bit about now or slightly later. Um, the way in which there are... Do it now. Okay, I'll do it now. The way in which there are lots of really interesting books about Goa written in Portugal. And they can be books written by Goans who have expatriated to Portugal, or they can be written by um, Portuguese authors who know Goa. So one example would be the novel by Paulo Varela Gomes, who was based in Goa for a long time, um, called in English, it would be Once, a, Once Upon a Time in Goa, which is a, a novel set in Goa in 1963. I think it's a fantastic novel. I think it's a real shame that um, it hasn't been translated into English and, and kind of got a readership over here. But that's not the only one. There are various other, other novels. If you like, that's part of the problematic. If you think about the relationship between kind of the wider India and Britain, because there is that shared medium of English, there are, there's a kind of a circulation back and forth of, of, of works. Whereas because of that, um, if you like, that linguistic split between Portugal and Goa, um, you know, the, 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 the sort of the, the right hand and the left hand not quite knowing what each other's doing. Um, and again, that goes back to that problematic you were talking about. How do we um, have an expanded idea in which 
um, works cross not just languages but readership. You also did the book uh, translated with uh, Helder Garmis, the uh, book by Epitasio Pais. That's right. So not translated, but um, we sorry, edited. Sorry. So um, we edited a um, a novel which Epitasio Pais, um, who's another really interesting go and writer, writing about the same time as Milos de Rocha. Um, so in the 1960s, actually perhaps slightly later. And I think what's interesting about him is that um, he's one. He's perhaps the only Portuguese language writer of the time who, if you like, starts to write about a Goa which is just India, whereas some of the other writers are maybe you know, in, 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 in the same way as your guest, recreating a past which they see as vanishing. I think his writing was very wasn't particularly interested in looking back. It was interested in the now and the future. I see. Um, I'm doing a, uh, a collection of his, uh, so similar to this, so a, co a complete collection of his stories, which yeah. hopefully will come out next year. We missed one book with uh, Cinnamon Tea, which was with Cinnamon Tea, have, have I missed something in between? Um, so, so, cinnamon, cinnamon, so they're hopefully doing um, this book by Epitasio Paes and also a book by another author called Augusto Rosario Rodriguez. Short um, stories. Short stories. Yeah. So um, that's so that short stories was the 1987 from Lengthening Shadows. So the final story in Lengthening Shadows was from 1987, uh, and the collection that was taken from is, is this this book called Regional Tales. Well, I'm going to call it Regional Tales, oh, okay. which should which should also come out. Who's your favorite short story writer, yeah. and why? Um, that's difficult to say. Um, if I have to choose one, yeah. I'm being put on the spot. Maybe I'll choose Vimela Devi. Um, partly because that was the first one that I found um, and I really enjoyed it. It was also, I met her and her husband in Lisbon just after I started um, working on Goan literature and I was still sort of fresh out of my PhD and still quite young and it was, it, was, it was such a lovely experience to meet these two I people see. at the end of their lives who were so interested in what I was doing. Uh, I, mean, I, I mean, at the end of her life, Imala Devi is still alive yeah. and well, hopefully, living in Barcelona. Yeah. But she's very old now. Um, and she was also always so generous I and see. so encouraging. Really? And so, um, and so young in spirit. I Just interest. I mean, I was trying to ask her about her writing and her life, and she kept asking me things about myself. <laughs> I said, no, let's not talk about me, let's talk <laughs> about you. Um, but it was so fascinating for somebody in their 90s to I be see. so interested in the world and so interested in what's happening was, was, was really lovely. Um, and I think she's done so much to, to preserve these stories. Yeah. So we talked about her work, um, Indo-Portuguese literature. But I think, I, again, if I'm sort of pressed to say it, I think while there are qualities and defects that work as any work, um, I think it really did more than anything to preserve these stories from the past. And if she hadn't done that, I think a lot more would have been lost than has been lost. One last question. Uh, to wind up, uh, Paul, how do you see this issue of uh, amnesia over go and writing in Portuguese? On the one hand, it is a clear loss, no doubt, because it's your tradition and you've lost it. On the other hand, it's a colonial tradition, so there could be this criticism that, you know, we are making much out of nothing. Mm. How would you weigh the issue? How would you see it? How would you judge its worth? Mm. Okay, that's that's an interesting question. So I think, there, I think one of the things that's made... Um, this this field and perhaps go in history and society difficult is the way in which there's been a dynamic that's been stopped and started again. So you had this kind of Portuguese literature and they stop. And I, I know that English dates back to the 19th century in Goa, but there's, there's a sort of hiatus and then there's a, an English literature which starts with something like a clean slate, the amnesia you're talking about. And that brings difficulties because peop, because authors don't know what's done in the past and generally literatures grow and thrive by people rewriting what's happened, taking up themes from the past. And that there's been a sort of uh, an interruption of that natural process in Goa. I wonder if there's been something similar even in the, the regional languages in, in Konkani and Marathi, because I know that in the early 20th century there was much more writing in Marathi, and then there was a sort of turn to Konkani. And I wonder if there would, and it's potentially there's been a, sim a similar sort of break. Um, I, I, would, I would push back a little bit about that, against that idea of, the writing in Portuguese being a colonial um, kind of thing. Uh, of course, you know, without colonization, without colonialism, there's no Portuguese. In the same way that there's no English, it's been brought from somewhere else, and that's undeniable. But you know, writers like Rocha, writers like Devi, writers like Paige, they were Goan, born and bred, uh, and they, they write as Goans. So this is, this is Goan literature. 
right? This is um, you know, the past of the history of go and writing. Um, and I think that a knowledge of how they wrote and what they wrote, uh, an appreciation both for the qualities and for the defects, would really be um, a useful um, contribution to the development of writing in Goa. You know, the, the, the Brazilian critic Antonio Candido um, describes how y you know that there is a, a, a functioning and thriving literary system when you can track a chain of themes and reactions, right? Both people copying, emulating, but also overturning and challenging. Uh, and I think that were there to be a greater understanding and knowledge of these stories, it would make that um, kind of strengthening and development of go and literature in any language, in English, in Konkani, or in Marathi, um, much more, much more likely and much more um, feasible. Thanks. Thanks so much. Very well said and very well put. It's interesting food for thought for us. But above all, I want to thank you for all the short stories you've translated. The overall context you've given us in your introductory essays and uh, concluding essays to many of your works and also not to forget the Wikipedia pages which you have helped create for, uh, you know, some of our writers whom we would have otherwise not known ourselves. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Frederick.